things out then. <laughs> sure you got it. <laughs> Sunday school teacher asks, now Johnny, tell me frankly, do you say prayers before eating? No ma'am. Johnny replied, I don't have to. My mom's a good cook. <laughs> You got that one right off. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Two weeks ago, we talked about angels. I'm going to carry that message on this week. Share with you more about what angels are all about in the scriptures. Reading from Psalm 34, verse 7. Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers him, delivers them. How sweet are God's promises. They're so special, so special when you read the word and see the promises that he has for us. As I shared with you two weeks ago, the angel of the Lord surrounds us, meaning he is on every side of us. There is not a portion of you that is not covered by the angel of God. He has set up camp around you. He has made his residence around you. He's there. And I was thinking that when we are in a spot and we feel like all hell is breaking loose around us. We feel like all hell is against us. Many of you feel like Satan is coming against you from every direction. And to be able to see just like Elisha's servants, but his eyes were open, and he saw the army of the Lord surrounding the enemy's army. Amen. To know that whatever is coming against you, the army of God that surrounds you is far greater than anything that you could begin to think. No matter what comes against you, how strong it is, how horrible it is, the army of God is surrounding you with a much greater force and a much greater power. And I can picture the angels saying, go ahead, make your move. Give us a reason to go to battle against you. So here's a question for you. How do you put all of the angels of heaven to work on your behalf? Uh -huh. That's a loaded question, but what would have happened if Elisha had have said, don't worry about it, I got this one. <laughs> I think we've got this one covered, God. We can handle this situation. <clears throat> and when you think about it, as you chuckle, like we wouldn't do a thing like that. Yet this is the this is something that we do all the time. 
We may not use those words. We may not say those words. But that's what we wind up doing. But God, I got it covered. I got to handle. I'm okay with this. I can deal with this. And so often we get ourselves in very difficult situations and we pray for God's help. And that's great. But then we go try to solve things on our own and wind up in a bigger mess. And basically what we're saying is this. God, I need your help, but I think I can handle it. I think I can do it better. I can do a better job at this one than you can. I can handle it. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, when you come to God and you ask God for help and then you go trying to deal with it yourself, you're telling God, forget it. I don't really need your help. I can do it. Now, I asked you, how do you put all the angels in heaven to work on your behalf? So let me put it this way. How do you release the angels to go to work on your behalf? Because the angels are not going to do anything until you do something. We have to ask. Psalm 118 verse 5 says, I call on the Lord in distress. So what's he doing? He's praying to God, saying, God, I need your help. In order to put our angels into motion to help us, we must call upon the Lord. The Message Bible says this, Push to the wall, I call to God. From the wide open spaces he answered, God's now at my side and, I, and I'm not afraid. Who would dare lay a hand on me? Push to the wall. How many of you have ever had your back up against the wall? Yeah, just about all of us. One time or another. Once or twice or something. Me too. My back's been up against the wall and I've had to say, God help. God help. I'm no different than the rest of you. So do you feel, even now that your back's up against the wall, if you do, call on God. Do you feel like you can't get out of the hole that you dug for yourself and you're in the bottom of that hole, the bottom of that pit? Call on God. It says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. And I, I, I think it's so interesting that David said, and the Lord answered me. If you ever have any doubt whether or not God's going to answer your prayer, put it to rest. God will answer your prayer. As David said, I called on the Lord in distress, and he answered. Acts chapter 16 tells when Paul and Silas were in jail. They were praying and singing to God. As Paul and Silas were doing this, we know they made an impact on the prisoners, on the population of that jail at that time, on those around them. Because it says the prisoners were listening. And I believe it was because of their prayers and their worship that this next thing happened. There was an earthquake. And all the doors opened. And all of their chains fell off. As you pray. And as you worship. As you release those angels to do a work on your behalf. They go right to work. It reminds me of the story, or of the song that says, Troubles vanish, hearts are mended in the presence of the Lord. When you worship God, 
When you come to Him and seek His face, when you come to Him and pray and ask Him, and you worship Him and you spend time in the presence of God, there's no way that you can continue to harbor thoughts of ill will towards anyone. There's no way that you can feel ill will towards anyone. And that's true because discord and strife doesn't exist in God's presence. You want peace? Worship God. You want harmony? Begin worshiping God. Spend time in His presence. I don't know how you feel, but we, when we begin the service with a time of worship, a peace and a comfort comes over those troubled souls. A peace and a comfort comes over us and brings us rest and peace. Acts chapter 12 verse 7 specifically says, an angel was at Peter's side in prison. A different time. The angel told Peter to stand up. And when he did, his chains fell off. Now, think about this though. As the angel spoke to Peter and told him to stand up, what would have happened if he didn't begin to move? Think about it. I don't know how the chains were in those days and the prisons in those days, but I can only imagine that they may have been chained so that they could only sit. They might have been able to stand. But if he hadn't have began to obey God and stand, I believe his chains would have stayed on. When God speaks to your heart, when he tells you to do something, as you put that into action, it goes to work. It was that faith card there. It was his faith in knowing when God spoke, he needed to act, and he did, and his chains fell off. Another good example that I'm sure many of you remember the story of Daniel. I always remember Daniel in the lion's den. And that story of Daniel is found in chapter 6 of the book of Daniel. Daniel was known as a man of prayer. Some guys got together and got the king to sign a decree that said that you couldn't worship anyone in prayer except for the king. For 30 days or you're going to be thrown into the lion's den. And we all know Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And here's what Daniel said to the king. When the king, when it was all said and done, the king was, he lost sleep that night. And when he got up in the morning, he comes to the lion's den and opens up the, the lid to look down and he wants to know how Daniel is doing. And Daniel's first response was, long live the king. But he says, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Mouths. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. The angels had a job to do, and that angel got the job done. Now, growing up in church, I always pictured, you know, the Sunday school lessons that Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den, and there's probably one or two lions in the lion's den, and some people that don't really believe this story too well kind of figure that the lions were fed food before he got thrown in so that they wouldn't harm him and all that, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of, yeah, we'll leave it at that. 
Okay, so I, I always thought it was just one or two lines that were in that den. But if you read the scripture in the book of Daniel, it says the king rounded up all of Daniel's accusers and their wives and their children and threw them into the lion's den. Now I've done a lot of reading about this, a lot of studying this, and some feel like that could have turned into up upwards of several hundred people because of the family and how the culture was in those days. And all of them were thrown into the den of lions, and here's what it says. Before any of them touched the ground, they were devoured. There's more than one or two lions in that den, folks. But you know what? It doesn't matter if there's one lion or a hundred lions. The angel shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was thrown in. They protected him in that den of lions, in that trial that he was going through, in that spot that he was in. Daniel didn't complain. Daniel didn't do any whining. He knew the God that he served would take care of him. <coughs> Daniel, because he was a man of God and a man of prayer, the angel shut the mouths of those lions when he was thrown in. And those same lions were loosed to take care of the wicked. Those same lions, the angels turned loose on those that were accusing the righteous, on those that would do harm to God's children. Yeah. If you walk with the Lord, it doesn't say if you are perfect. It says in Psalm 118, verse 5, I called on the Lord. I called on the Lord, and He heard my prayer. Psalm 91, verse 9, Because you have made the Lord, I'm skipping down to the end of that verse, your dwelling place. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, you are dwelling in the presence of the Most High God, you are releasing the angels of God to protect you and take care of you. Verse 11 of Psalm 91 says, He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. If you want to be protected from the evils of this world, call on the Lord and make Him your dwelling place. A side note here, I was thinking that, you know, as I pray, I pray what the scripture calls a hedge of protection around people. And when you pray a hedge of protection, you are releasing the angels of God to protect those that you ask them to. You, as a believer, can do that. And in this case, the most common time that I'm praying this way is on behalf of my family. My prayer is usually when I'm praying God's hedge of protection and Daddy's not close by and Daddy's not somewhere else, God, protect them from harm. Protect them, God. And another time that I do that is in this case, this past week, I have been praying and I've mentioned to you last Sunday to pray for Don Scarlett as he was off fighting the fires. Praying that God will provide a hedge of protection around him. This is something he doesn't even know, doesn't even understand. I haven't said a word to him. But praying that God will protect him 
in that time when he is in harm's way. Let's go a little further now. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 to 21, and I'm not going to read the scripture here, but here we read how the angel, how an angel had been sent to Daniel. This is in a different time, a different situation. And here's part of what the angel says. It says, Daniel, do not fear, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have came because I heard your words. If there is ever doubt in your mind that God hears and answers your prayer, read Daniel. Read Daniel chapter 10. It says, from the moment you pray, from the moment you called on me, God sent me to answer that prayer. Many times we feel like God doesn't care, like God doesn't hear us, and usually it's because we're not getting the answer that we want. Sometimes it's because we don't stop and listen after we pray. And it could be that after we pray, we don't say, God, help me to just listen for your voice. I had a time when I had went to pray with somebody. And when I walked into the room to pray with them, they just began talking and talking and talking. And after a time, I says, okay, stop right there. I'm here for a reason. I'm here to pray for you, not listen to you complain. And now it's my turn. I listen. I'm going to pray for you, and God will heal you. Sometimes, and that's how it is with our relationship with God, we ask God for an answer to a certain and a specific prayer, and then we just keep on talking instead of sitting down and listening for his response. Sometimes, although God won't say it to you, sometimes I, I know he'd want to say, shut up and listen for a minute. <laughs> I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. Because from the first day you prayed, I heard your prayer. Now you need to listen to me, what I want to tell you what I want to speak to you about. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. In reference to the angels, this is what it says. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The answer to that question is yes. That's what they're sent for, is to minister to your every need. They are sent by God to reach out to you. Minister to your needs. If you're sick, ask God for healing. When you pray, that answer is sent. God will dispatch or send His angels to meet your needs. His angels are sent to minister to your situation. Whatever it is, whatever it is, they're sent. And we need to allow God to do His work in our lives. If you want God to do a work in your life, don't interfere with it. Say, God, go for it. Do a work in my life. Angels are ministering spirits. When you get riled up about something, I had somebody tell me last week, I'm mad at so-and-so. I said, what happened? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just mad at him. First of all, if you're dwelling in the Lord, that's not going to happen. 
But if there are legitimate things in your life that get you worked up about something, let the angel of God give you a peace in your spirits and do a work in your hearts because that's one of the things that angels do. Do you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? If any of you have been in church much time in your life, you've heard about those, those guys. They refused to bow down and worship any other god except the one true God. They didn't throw a temper tantrum because the king had decided to throw them into the furnace. And, and, and tell the king, well, you, you just can't do that to me because I'm a Christian. I'm okay, you know. They spoke boldly to the king, not disrespectfully, but they spoke boldly to the king because they knew God had everything, what? Under control. Under control. Here you've got three guys ready to go be thrown into a furnace, and they're saying, don't worry about it, God's got it under control. And, and the army... The men, the strong men of the king, comes and picks them up and throws them in, and all of the army that's throwing them in are killed because of the heat. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have confessed to their God that they know that he is greater than anything that surrounds them. He's greater than those that come against him, that come against them. God protected them. And this is what they said. This is how they responded. The God we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. You think that was a word of speaking from confidence, knowing that God had everything under control? How would you react if you were about to be thrown into a fire? On purpose, not tripping into a fire, but being thrown into a fire. The God I serve, the God we serve, us, is able to protect us. The God we serve, has everything under control. And God didn't deliver them out of the furnace. He walked with them through. He walked with them through that furnace, that fiery trial, the problems that they were going through at the time, the problems that we face. God walks through those situations with us. And he took care of them through their trial. The secret to tapping into the power of God is to make him your dwelling place. That is the key. Spend time with God. Spend time in his presence. He should be first in your life in everything that you do. <clears throat> God promises protection so long as you make Him your dwelling place. If you rest in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I shall trust. And what does God do when you say that? He commands his angels to guard you in all your ways so that no harm befalls you nor any disaster will overtake you. Amen. amen. And amen.